welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we are very excited for this webinar, Building Bridges, the Value of DEI and Story Drive Marketing, um, presented by DV Entertainment. Real quick, we know that some of you all are um, not familiar with STS, so I just want to give a quick overview. Uh, we are a professional association dedicated to the promotion and development of tourism throughout the Southeast United States. We represent 13 states and um, District of Columbia, and we really focus on four pillars, education, advocacy, recognition, and networking. And a little bit about this webinar. Uh, the value of DEI and story drive marketing will give a candid yet positive conversation to offer insight of the value of building meaningful relationships and connections with organizations and community leaders of key minority and underrepresented de demographics in tourism and tourism marketing. African Americans and LGBTQ+, Latinos, Latinx, and communities. With the increase of widespread connectivity, we find this perfect time to increase your outreach, relationship buildings, and asking for honest feedback so you can collaborate. Increase the inclusion, diversity, and representation in your destination marketing. Working together to tell authentic stories that resonate with those key minorities that have spending power they hold. And without further ado, David Verde is going to take a real quick, quick second to uh, give a brief overview of DB Entertainment. Thank you, David. Awesome. Thank you, Veronica. I uh, just want to thank everybody who uh, is participating today. Uh, we have a really, really dynamic group of folks from what I feel is a, a very key group of underrepresented demographics in especially in the Southeast tourism region. Um, but uh, I, I do want to make a note, you know, there's a, um, we started uh, planning this about two months ago and there has been um, some recent events uh, that uh, do make this very uh, this conversation very relevant. Um, however, we just wanted to let you know that we we don't necessarily intend to make any um, political commentary related to that because um, a lot of the other things that we can hopefully share with you um, is just as valuable um, moving into the future. Uh, but um, DB Entertainment, we're just so you know, like we're a video production company. Um, we're minority owned. I'm a veteran as well. Um, my, our crew, colleagues, uh, everybody that we hire is really diverse. It's a really big priority to us as a company um, that we, it's uh, kind of a centerpiece of the work we do. Uh, but I don't really want to spend too much time talking about what we do. I really want other people to have a chance to speak. And I'm actually going to be participating on the panel. Um, I am Latino. I'm an immigrant as well from Honduras. Uh, so I'll be sharing some perspective from uh, Hispanic, Latino, Latinx, uh, as well as a, a video professional uh, filmmaker and documentarian. So I am going to introduce our moderator, who you will be um, hearing ask the questions, and she'll take it from here. So I'd um, like to welcome Sage. She's one of our producers and uh, editors with uh, our company. So Sage, the floor is yours. Hello, my name is Sage. I'm very happy to be here today uh, moderating. And let's go ahead and just introduce who our panelists are today. First, we're going to start with Wirt Confroy. He works for the Virginia Tourism Corporation as the Director of Business Development, as well as working with Virginia's LGBT tourism marketing out of Richmond. Thank you so much for joining us today, Wirt. That's my pleasure to be here. Thank you. Next, we have Alicia Phelps. A, uh, she is a lifelong resident of Northeast Tennessee and currently serves as the executive director of the Northeast Tennessee Tourism Association. I look forward to chatting with you all today. Thank you so much, Alicia. Um, and just a note that uh, DV Entertainment has worked with Netta on their most recent video project, just so everyone is aware. Um, next, we have KJ Kearney. KJ Kearney is a North Charleston native and an active advocate and leader within the Black African American and Gullah Geechee community of the Charleston Low Country area. He is the founder of Red Rice Day in the city of Charleston, as well as the social media movement, Black Food Fridays. Thank you so much for joining us, KJ. Thanks for having me. And of course, David Verde, which you have already met. So I'm going to pass it uh, back to, to 
David just for a moment, um, and we are going to talk about some of the uh, most recent projects that everyone has been involved in. Oh, awesome. So I'm actually, uh, uh, not to lie, I'm actually just updating something real quick <laughs> uh, so I can introduce. So well, we're going oh, to share a slide here. We're going to let everybody just kind of present their most recent project. Um, everybody is here representing um, various demographics, Latin, uh, Black, African-American, um, LGBTQ. Uh, so we're going to start off with KJ, and I'm going to get our slide going here and go ahead and share. So KJ, as soon as you see that, you are welcome to start talking, my friend. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is KJ Kearney. As it's been eloquently said, uh, I'm the founder of Red Rice Day, which basically meant I wrote a proclamation uh, that the mayor, that gentleman you see next to me, the mayor of Charleston, the Honorable John Tecklenburg and his city council approved so that we could recognize the benefits that my ancestors had to Charleston. People always come to Charleston for the food. My ancestors are directly responsible for that. Uh, culinary art scene, that cuisine that everybody loves about Charleston. And so they were able to, we were able to work together to officially get a day to recognize those efforts. Uh, this is my most recent output, uh, Black Food Fridays. It literally started April 5th. Uh, when I was in the middle of writing a book about Beyonce and civic engagement and I needed a break and I started this to highlight all the black owned restaurants that were open during COVID-19 and it literally took a life of its own. Um, it's been growing exponentially. And as you can see, these are some of the posts that we've been doing. We highlight restaurants, but we also try to provide information actionable information for people to actually participate in and work with the black community, whether they're food producers, restaurant owners, as you can see in the top left, those are two brothers that have their own delivery service. So we try to give you multiple ways to support the black community. And this is, this is me, uh, black food Fridays with an S if you don't mind next time. Uh, but that's, that's us on all of our platforms. And if you have any questions, please feel free to email me and David, thank you so much for allowing me to participate. Yeah. It's good to have you here, man. All right. So we'll have Alicia. She'll share um, some of what she's been up to in her most recent marketing campaign. Yes, um, thank you all for having me so uh, so much. I'm, I'm looking forward to today. Uh, my name is Alicia Phelps. I'm with the Northeast Tennessee Tourism Association, and we are a regional destination marketing organization. There's um, eight of us in the state of Tennessee, and we market the eight counties and portions of Southwest Virginia on the very tip of Northeast Tennessee that touches North Carolina, Virginia, and Kentucky. Um, and so one of the things that we set forth last year, uh, if you want to move over to the next sl slide, please, um, was to really focus on Northeast Tennessee being a welcome community to everyone. And that was going to be our main goal. And um, so what we did uh, was a series of videos. Unfortunately, um, we have not been able to launch them with the manner that we would have liked to do um, due to the um, COVID-19 virus, but we will do that when applicable and appropriate. Um, but we wanted to show all inclusively, whether it's um, like you see here on our magazine cover that we did, we also did a visitor's guide. We did a series of four videos and what was raised to my attention by a local um, diversity and inclusive group, the Northeast Tennessee and Southwest Virginia um, diversity and inclusion group with a friend of mine, Adam Dixon, um, was that in tourism marketing in our area, we, we maybe were, a la were lacking just a bit. Um, and, and I was just, I, I couldn't, you know, when, once that was brought to my attention, I wanted to be part of the change and with us being a regional organization I knew that we could set the tone not only for our area but for those near us to show that you know y'all come down and see us we we want to see everybody and everyone's welcome so that's a little bit um, snippet of our story and how we're working to set the bar for others and there's me um, and there's how you can reach out to me and um, that's all I have for my intro cool Thank you, Alicia. Uh, well, I'm going to just reintroduce myself, but uh, DB Entertainment, I'm not going to talk much, but um, this is probably one of our largest projects uh, that we actually self-produce. Pr um, it's an outdoor adventure travel series. Um, it, it's kind of an all-encompassing project at this point. Um, and one of our primary goals with this 
um, from the get-go, having personally just been involved in the outdoor industry and worked in the outdoor industry as, long, as well as media, is uh, pushing a, a pretty prominent a, a level of diversity within the interactions that we have on this because it is sort of a promotional project where you you're spotlighting destinations in a positive way um but if you can imagine you know it's it's very male driven it's uh you know a lot of caucasians that are are often presented in the outdoor space and we wanted to change that the best we can and we did okay and you know just to be candid you know with this particular project that even we have control over we did okay and yet we still have improvements to make especially with representation of people of color you know we had a few we had lots of women we had lgbtq plus uh people who were in a, a part of segments but we we really lacked on on the the people of color so even even as a company we're trying to work to improve our efforts with with the diversity and representation within the outdoor media that we are producing so it, you know even as a person of color as an immigrant you know we struggle at trying to to put out our own representation you know it's it's hard work um, but that's all. I just, uh, you know, we'll sure we'll dive into other stuff, but I'll move the floor over. I'm going to stop sharing and I'll let Wirt screen share from his end. Okay. <clears throat> Can everybody hear me? I think I've been able to DJ this working. Great. So, um, you know, we started our LGBT program. Uh, we had a task force in 2015, 2016. And so we've had several years to really create and work and, uh, you know, maneuver through different areas of LGBT marketing and, uh, I'm not going to really cover all that, but what I wanted to focus on today, <clears throat> excuse me, um, is, if my little slides will work, yeah, um, you know, our, our uh, consumer engagement with the LGBT is just so tied to our, our local residents and our DMOs. And, um, you know, we do have a website. It does allow a visitor or a Virginia businesses to add themselves and click the LGBT friendly button. And while that's great, you know, the definition of LGBT friendly and to whom and what part of the LGBTQ plus community. So there is some, I love that we're able to do that. But what we've been doing recently is really focusing on kicking that up a notch and drilling down and really trying to help all the different intersectional uh, identities within the LGBTQ plus community really share their Virginia experience. So as I mentioned, we had our LGBT task force and we did what you do with all campaigns. We did research, we looked at resources and goals. And uh, one thing we did do was spend a lot of time uh, on a staff education document. Uh, before we did anything, we wanted Virginia's Welcome Center uh, staff who we manage and are part of. Uh, we wanted everyone to know what we were doing within our own organization, uh, many of whom did not know what LGBT meant. Uh, so that was a really important step. And we also then moved on to our industry education. So we did reach out to our industry, let them know what we wanted to do and get their input before we did anything. Uh, because again, another massive uh, educational process. And you know, we're tourism and we want to uh, have everyone connect every visitor with the host that wants them the most. So as you can imagine, like any other state, Virginia has people in the industry who aren't excited about LGBT and don't want to participate. So we had to have big conversations about this was totally voluntary. If you want to reach the market, it's a business decision. Uh, and then we moved on with our marketing. So what I want to uh, focus on real briefly is something that happened recently, which is Virginia passed our Virginia Values Act. So for the first time since, you know, Jamestown in 1607, first permanent English settlement, uh, queer Virginians actually have equal rights to our non-queer and non-LGBTQ plus citizens. So it's huge. Uh, you know, there are a lot of differences uh, between uh, marginalized communities, whether they're women, Virginia Indians and Virginia's first people, African Americans and black Virginians um, and queer Virginians. And there are differences, but there are similarities. And again, the interdiscipline, uh, inter, uh, intersectionality really brings people together. So one thing that happened this year was our Virginia Values Act. And, and a lot of things happened. First, uh, Indigenous Virginia ownership. Uh, there was new recognition for Virginia tribes and their property. And uh, there's going to be some new development that's happening within those, those properties and those new property rights. Pretty big, massive uh, developments, including some 
uh, casinos, which is new for Virginia, new legislation. So that's huge for culturally for Virginia's first people and also for their business opportunities and their access to business. Um, Virginia, you know, uh, ratified the Equal Rights Amendment. And, uh, you know, I think since 1920, when women had the right to vote, it's now th 2020, huge for Virginia. Uh, also, uh, uh, in Virginia, you know, uh, since Charlottesville years ago, affected the South in many ways. I mean, honestly, before Charlottesville, uh, you know, there were a lot of issues with, uh, uh, you know, marketing history, colonial history, and where's the other history? And in Virginia, a new law was passed that cities now have the rights to decide what to do with their statutes, which they did not have the right to do before. So we're going to see across Virginia different communities making different decisions about how they, uh, what statutes they have and how they, uh, and where they're displayed and how they're interpreted. And then also the Virginia Values Act, uh, which, uh, you know, really uh, affected Virginia's LGBTQ plus community. And as you can see, we now have, uh, you know, there's uh, discrimination is prohibited on sexual orientation, gender, including housing, uh, public, private employment, public accommodations, access to credit. Uh, so it's huge for us. We're just starting to understand what this is and how it affects the lives of Virginians and Virginia travelers. Um, uh, just as an example, uh, you know, we got a lot of good media coverage with that. And sadly, it did. this did happen right in the middle of COVID. So we are able, you know, we're not, uh, especially with the different phases of, of COVID and travel, we're not welcoming people to Virginia or have not been, uh, you know, because of travel restrictions. But if those change with the phases, we are going to be looking at the LGBTQ plus market and maybe a new level of safety. Uh, for them uh, when they travel, visiting friends and family, and just traveling in uh, general. Um, moving forward, we're going to continue doing something we have done, which is important to me, and that is we have our blog, and we want to, uh, again, reach locals in Virginia and reach the people making things happen. Um, so we, ha we do have our blog, and we are lucky in Virginia to have individuals uh, with different communities who have really worked for years to make some things happen. One is Virginia's new uh, uh, Black Pride RVA, which has happened for several years. And also on the left, you'll see uh, a friend of mine, uh, Fernando Rodriguez, and he uh, started Virginia's first Latinx Pride. So I'm lucky to have these partners doing this and engaging all of our LGBTQ plus communities and these communities within. Uh, and we're going to continue to look for locals. Uh, history is another thing we're looking at. Um, you know, we have new uh, we have some ongoing and some new LGBTQ plus history that we're mining and sharing with visitors. Um, and these are just some examples of our Southwest History Tour. Uh, we have new books that have been written, one um, uh, several years ago in a newer book about different regional LGBTQ plus life in Virginia. So this has given me a lot of stories and people to connect with and work with. Um, moving forward, uh, you know, Virginia as a state uh, has what we call the Golden Crescent, and it's that East Coast where most people live, where most of our urban areas are, and it's where most LGBTQ plus people have lived forever, particularly uh, the Hampton Roads coastal area uh, with the military, uh, you know, which uh, we have queer people visiting and traveling, you know, uh, decades and de decades during, you know, world wars, and we have the the military base is there. And in Virginia, you know, outside in the state, most people, these areas that you'll see in green, or where most people think gay people are and where there might be prides. And as we've continued, our, as I've continued the work, we've seen that there are a lot of Main Street communities uh, in Shenandoah Valley and some even small town communities uh, that are kicking in. So, you know, this is definitely more of an accurate visual of the partners I now have to work with who are interested in the LGBT travel market. And there are also communities where local queer people are out more and owning businesses. And even almost more importantly, uh, allies are coming out as an ally and, and joining Pride and joining uh, this work. Uh, if you were to talk to somebody outside of Virginia, these green dots are probably where they think they're safe to go and enjoy. So we have a, a well-earned negative perception in some ways, but it has changed so much in the last five years, 10 years. So, you know, more and more communities really are uh, active local queer people living there and also uh, welcoming LGBT visitors. 
One thing in the bottom left corner is Bristol, Virginia. I have heard from a lot of out-of-state people and in-state that, you know, the further southwest you go, you're not going to go to Bristol because you're going to drive through a lot of uh, political signs and, and uh, uh, Civil War flags, Confederate flags. Uh, but actually, Bristol was going to have their first pride this year, uh, estimated with over 10,000 people. And sadly, that's not going to happen. Uh, but, you know, I'm really excited about the community engagement, more locals coming out more uh, allies coming out and joining, uh, uh, creating these, you know, Main Street and these community environments of, of equality and welcomeness. Um, this is a quick snapshot of, of new partnerships and, and existing ones that we're forming from regional prides to smaller community prides. Uh, we're working on some city guides with different cities about locals saying where they stay, where they recommend you eat and what you do. And it's not just cis, white, gay guys. It's people that have lived there that are non-binary, they're non-Caucasian. Uh, again, cracking open that, um, that intersectionality and getting other voices that are there and have been there. Um, this was our Pride schedule this year. I was so excited. We had 32 Pride festivals and events in Virginia. Sadly, uh, the coronavirus has stomped out uh, more than half of that. And we may see some other closures moving forward. But I'm just excited to have this strong base. Next year, we're going to come out even stronger. And we are looking at a virtual pride. A lot of uh, I'm, I'm just helping share virtual pride around Virginia uh, this month, which is going to be an exciting thing, too. So uh, lastly, um, we do have our website. And one thing we're doing now is really uh, we do have explicit LGBT things. They need to be there. Uh, people need to see gay people uh, doing queer-centric things. But we also just need to be added to the mix. And our communications team has done a great job of taking our just traditional websites and social. And you know, you're gonna be seeing LGBT travel uh, pointed out and then just not. So uh, you know, uh, one great example, and I'll, I'll end with this, um, we do have a lot of implicit things happening. So this is a great picture of a Virginia vibrant community. And in here I see white people, brown people, black people, uh, people of different races and, and you know, there are no arrows pointing out who's what and what they identify as. And that's really important. Uh, that's what most of our marketing is going to be. Uh, and you can just, you know, see that in this image. Uh, we do also have explicit messages of love, Virginia's for lovers. Uh, what we're adding now <clears throat> and including are other uh, images that have been in Virginia forever, which are explicit and they happen to be LGBT. So, we're, uh, you know, bringing them together. Sometimes it's explicit, sometimes it's implicit. And then finally, uh, with our, our branding, uh, Virginia is known as for history lovers and with our, our uh, adopted uh, pride heart, we also combine those. Great example, uh, I had a lesbian couple who uh, walked the, the Appalachian Trail. They did some blogging for us and they used our uh, outdoor uh, logo, but we used the pride heart with it. And that was something they really, felt connected with. So my last thing is that history. Virginia is known for history, and it's, it's the thing that we're known for the most, but it's colonial history that we're known for. And it's usually, you know, white uh, cisgender men who ran America and, and were our leaders. So when you look at history, it's really all these things on the left. It starts with individuals and family and faith communities, and it ends up with laws and leadership. So all the history we have in Virginia is tracking these uh, usually male Caucasian colonial identities and to how they created and ran America. But uh, unfortunately, if you're queer, you're just not included in any of these, really. Uh, and to this day, their individuals not included in their family or until the Virginia Values Act, it was legal to not include people in leadership and in, in education. So that law will help us start changing culture, uh, which I'm excited about. So my new project is about history. So if this circle represents Virginia history, uh, let's look at the queer history we have. And if you can't see it, I'll blow it up a little bit. That's, that black line is really our queer history. And so what we're doing is working with the Virginia Museum of History and Culture, universities doing oral history projects, and I showed you the others. And so we uh, have a, a museum, Virginia Museum of History and Culture, uh, that has an exhibit, The Story of Virginia. And for the first time ever this year, They've added an LGBTQ plus corner. And uh, most, uh, I think, uh, most important and something that's very 
uh, profound, I think, is the main case is a case that's empty. And it says, why is this empty? We don't have LGBTQ plus history because we've never uh, allowed it to be. And now it is there. We have these books. We have our research. So call us and we're going to start filling this case. And I think that's really profound. And that's kind of a new goal of mine. And, you know, the state is to mine history and tell those stories because it will enhance our tourism. And last, um, you know, a world crowd was in New York this past year. Uh, you know, to get afloat, you kind of had to know somebody and spend a lot of money. And I'm so lucky to have Outwire 757, the LGBTQ plus media company. They went and said, just send us your stuff and we'll represent Virginia and ourselves. And so I don't know the media value of this, but just the life value was amazing. And so we actually were, Virginia, shockingly, was in World Pride in New York. So uh, moving forward, you know, we have our website if you have any questions about it. <clears throat> and, um, you know, I'll leave you with these three things. For me, the most important is building intersectional relationships and trust. You know, I am a queer person in Virginia and have had a different life and travel differently than my uh, other counterparts, but I'm also a white cis gay guy and I don't represent. So one is to build that trust. Another is to partner. And the third is really to hand over the mic. Uh, all those other identities that are in Virginia that share their story, it's not my story to tell it's theirs and I hand that mic over and let them do that. So um, this is my contact information. We have our LGBT social website and our uh, industry website. Um, I know I've taken a little bit of time. So uh, that's what I have and anybody can contact me with anybody. Okay, thank you so much, Wirt. I think that was um, excellent and, and kind of in a, in a sense goes to kick off our um, question and answer period. Um, and, and sort of what you were talking about is, is very broad because you're on the state level of working with that. Um, but I, I think it'll be a good lead into our first question. But before I start, I want to um, go into uh, the fact that any of you watching can access uh, the question and answer little button underneath your video screen. I will try to get to questions. Um, if, they, if they bounce off of the questions that we're already answering, I'll try to get to them as we come to them. Um, but also if, if at the end we have some time, I will uh, try to get to all those questions. So please be um, using that app if you have questions. Okay, so our first question, um, and I'm just gonna, I wanna open it up to all of our panelists, um, and we're gonna try to keep each of these questions under, uh, you know, two minute answers, just so we can kind of move through a broad range of subjects when it comes to diversity in marketing. Um, so if I, if I cut you off or something, please don't take offense. There's literally so much uh, we could say on this subject. Um, but our first question is, why is it important or attractive for an agency to approach marketing campaigns with diversity and inclusion in mind? All right, I'll start off. Oh, no, KJ, go ahead, KJ. You got it. <clears throat> well, um... Sorry, I think I just accidentally. Can you unmute? There we're we go. in there. All right. Yeah, I mean, quite simply, um, everyone's money is good, you know, uh, despite whichever affinity group or uh, background, as social economic background you may have, religious background you have, everyone's money is good. And so it would behoove us, I think, to start marketing in a way that is inclusive of everyone so that everyone can be seen, everyone can feel included and then want to participate in whatever activities or whatever uh, is hot in the region that you're marketing from. Everyone deserves an opportunity to see that and see it through their lens. Um, so I think it's a good opportunity not only to be inclusive, but to expand your breadth of business and, and, and let everybody know that you are open for everyone. Okay, thank you. Any any of our other panelists have anything to add to that? I would. Um, we, as a, as a DMO, we bid out every single thing. So I, we knew from the get-go what we were wanting to do with our particular campaign. So I encourage, you know, from a personal uh, perspective, if you're a DMO, write a really solid RFP and what you want. And then when you see those bids come in, 
take a look, see what, who matches, because, you know, sometimes you're going to have folks who, um, this is what they do all day long. They're really great at it, but they may not specifically get, um, they may not specifically get your message and your vibe and they may not match exactly what goal you're wanting to do. And we had something very specific that we wanted. So the agency that we did choose to work with for this particular project, not only helped with that, but they also opened up our eyes a little bit more to how we could dig deeper into some of the issues. Okay, thank you, Alicia. Um, I'm getting two different questions in our uh, messages right now that sort of have to do with this. Um, the first one I'm seeing is, is it possible for a DMO to show solidarity with, the, solidarity with these groups without being overly political? Um, and I think this is a, another part of that question is, um, and this one's specifically directed a little bit more to KJ, how can businesses support efforts like Black Food Fridays, um, especially from a marketing lens to help promote? I'd like to hear Alicia go first with the DMO and then I'll come behind her if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we cover really as a DMO, you do have to cover a really broad uh, spectrum of things um, when you're promoting, whether it's family fun or history or outdoors. So how we did this, um, we were very, very cautious and almost subliminal in what we were doing. We didn't put it out there in people's faces. And when we do end up launching these campaigns, um, we're not going to be like, hey, you know, it, all minorities, we're all inclusive, we're all diverse here, come see us. No, it's not going to be like that. For example, our two of our videos, one was a really strong female artist that's local. We always feature locals in anything that we do. We want to be true. Um, she was a really strong female artist, and um, she didn't fit the cute little country singer uh, persona that you envisioned, so we knew she'd be a good fit. And then for our outdoors one, women are often not represented in the outdoor arena, and so not only did we want to have um, an African-American and an LGBTQ or LGBT uh, personality in there, we did them both, and on top of that, we did an all-female cast. So we were just kind of like power punching right through that. But then when we launch these, we're not going to say, hey, look at all these girls doing this. It's going to be very subliminal. And I think that's a great way to do that without being like super political in your face. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree with that. You know, I think you, you can make very small or and, and, and visual elements, if you will, you know, whether it's still images, whether it's uh, promotional driven, you know, just in text even, you know, or video to align yourself with with uh, um, showing that represented uh, re representation of that diversity or that group um, and you know let's use uh, African American black African American right now it, it's probably you may have like two weeks of work to reach out and find some organizations that are doing stuff that are uh, that are relevant to the black African American community or the, the the queer community or the Latino Latinx community um, to find them who are just doing the thing they do all the time. And so I think if you want to try to approach it from a non-political way, if you can just get involved with organizations that are just doing that stuff all the time. And that way it does, it, it is coming from a very genuine standpoint because it's, it's an ongoing community effort. And now you can contribute to contribute to that as well as expanding your, your connections, essentially like your network of community. I'll quickly support what David said. Um, I know one thing we found, we have not really had to, from scratch, start create new LGBTQ plus campaigns. Uh, to David's point, we just looked into our, our industry and those things are happening organic. The Black Restaurant Experience Week, Latinx Pride, Black Pride, even in other communities that are Main Street communities, smaller prides uh, that are happening that are local every weekend. So we are just sharing their information and we're not uh, really uh, retooling it or changing it at all. And we're just promoting it and also helping those organ organizations connect with others. So we're finding as just these organic things are happening, we're sharing that story uh, rather than creating a new campaign because th that story is organic, it's true, and that really is, is what's happening. So I'll uh, say that's a large part of, of what we do as well. Um, and lastly, I guess I'm going to be the person that goes a little to the left. Uh, I don't know how you can do these things without coming off as political. How you spend your money is a political act. 
how what you choose to highlight, what you choose to eat, where you choose to stay, transportation, social justice, these things are all political. So if the goal is to stay away from political things, then you're just going to have to market to the traditional, you know, husband, wife, two kids, dog over and over and over. When you step outside of that framework, though, there are going to be people whose sensibilities are going to be hurt or offended. And that's a decision that you have to make. So I don't think you can avoid being political because these are political acts who you choose to highlight for your state or your city is somewhat of a political act. Uh, but I, that goes into the question, I guess, that was specifically for me. Um, how can how can you know people support businesses like Black Food Fridays, I think, is making that conscious decision that, yes, some people might be upset about this or, uh, you know, some people might not understand what we're doing, but still reach out to those affinity groups or those uh, those organizations or individuals that have their ear or their or their finger on the pulse of whatever community it is that you want to highlight. That's number one, paying them what they're worth. That's number two. And then three, lastly, negotiating with grace. And what I mean by that is, uh, in my experience, I get called at the very end, right? It's like the venue has already been set. The price has already been set. The speakers have already been set. The marketing has already been. And then it's like, oh, yeah, by the way, we need to market to black people. Let's get KJ in here. And then, you know, if I don't produce immediately it's like, oh, well, we wasted that money. Well, you have to, especially with uh, groups that aren't usually at the DMO table, A, be conscious about bringing them to the table, B, give them the resources to do the work, and then three, give them the opportunity to fail. Let them try. This is going to be new for everyone. So let them try. You might have to go through two or three organizations to get it right, but where you put your money is a political act, and you have to be conscious about that. And I, I think, I hope I answered the question, but I don't think you can be, I don't think you can do those things without someone taking it as some kind of political act. And I'm okay with that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I, I think that, um, that we covered a lot of bases for all, a lot of those questions. So the next, um, question I'm going to direct to Alicia at first, but again, uh, anyone can kind of fill in afterwards. Um, and that is, what are some challenges that you face in approaching your projects with more inclusivity and diversity as a focus? Uh, for everything from, you know, approaching your bosses or board of directors to say, hey, we need to try something different, um, to, you know, staffing for those projects. Uh, I, I think it would be helpful for some people who are approaching this to understand that it, it might not just be super easy to, to include um, more of a diverse lens. Yes, thank you. Um, it definitely is is not easy, and, and we had mentioned before driving through Southwest Virginia and talking about Bristol, which is one of the cities that I cover, um, and there are some areas in Northeast Tennessee that are not as progressive as some of our other cities, so uh, we were really fortunate. Our board was um, right, right in line with us, and we applied for a grant with the Tennessee Department of Tourist Development, who they were 100% supportive of what we were doing and were part of our mission. Um, to do this project. So I encourage folks to maybe look for opportunities like that as well in your communities. But, um, you know, the, that part was easy. The hard part was, um, you know, I had this conversation with our Diversity and Inclusive Alliance. They were on board. They were ready. They reached out and made that connection for me because personally, I had a really hard time you know, frameworking, how, how am I going to ask these, these people to represent our area to show that they're welcomed, um, and, and just be part of the pulse that's going to change our voice when maybe they're not comfortable doing that. So those were some really, really difficult conversations that I was nervous about having, but I did have the community support with that group behind me to do that. Now, when it came down to filming, we had everything put together with the locals that were cast as part of it. Some of them dropped out. I don't know why. Um, maybe they were no longer uncomfortable. Some definitely had some schedule conflicts. Um, and we really worked around their schedules because I knew, you know, when I saw the profiles of these people, this is who I wanted to represent us. Um, and then also while filming, you know, I got to hear conversations. We got kind of deep in some of them. And, um, you know, I had, my eyes were opened. I, I, you know, I wasn't aware of some of the things that they had gone through still to this day. It's unbelievable. Um, 
and and they wanted to to voice that they wanted to be like look we're changing and and northeast tennessee tourism has that platform to help us and we want to be part of that movement so it's hard um and and you just have to be be ready to face some of the criticisms you have to be ready to face some of the feedback and you have to be prepared to hear no i don't i don't feel comfortable doing this i support you but you know this may not be something that i want to that i want to do so Thank you, Alicia. Anyone else want to add to that? Just um, expectation of certain challenges? Uh, yeah, I'll say something. You know, I think coming from, you know, the an agency's perspective, you know, even when I'm proposing project ideas or submitting proposals, you know, I've, uh, you know, I happen to propose a, a project uh, for an organization who lived in a market that has a substantial Latin uh, Latino population. And I said, we need to prioritize figuring out a way so we can reach this audience. And they actually, you know, their question was like, how, how is that audience really that valuable as far as like a, you know, as a marketing standpoint? Um, so, you know, I think ultimately it's, it's just trying to f navigate ways to, to, to educate and inform the best way you can and, and hope it sticks. And I actually saw a question uh, that was kind of relevant to that. It's just, um, you know, to, to educate your bosses or board directors, I, I think you just have to like, you know, you, you it's asking about being disrespectful of past work. And I think this is kind of the same thing that I, as a, as a, as an outside company that, that tries to produce work for people, you know, we're, we're trying to politely let them know like, Hey, I think this is something that's been lacking. And I think we could maybe offer this, um, this type of content that's that's targeted to a broader um, underrepresented group effectively and just kind of keep expanding on the work that you've already done. Not, not to say like, Oh, that project you did before was, was too whatever, you know, so that's, that's my approach. Excellent. Thank you so much, David. Um, I'm going to move on to our next question, which uh, someone just asked a very similar um, question in the chat. Um, I'm going to direct this one to KJ. Something you mentioned in your first response was the importance of getting uh, people involved at the very beginning um, and not just as this sort of add-on at the end. What are some key components to successfully executing research and development and uh, approaching telling diverse stories? Um, and what we have in the chat, someone, uh, Julie is asking about talking about the difference between diversity, equity, and inclusion, and those things not all being the, the same. All right, those are a lot of questions. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just do the last part, if you don't mind. Um, and if I'm not answering, Julie, what you want me to answer, please put it in the chat and I'll come back. I don't wanna take up too much time. Um, the first thing, and me and David have talked about this before, the first thing that I like to iterate is that diversity and inclusion are verbs right? They are action words. That means you have to do stuff. Um, I'm a college football, former college football athlete, college football fan. You know, I'm in the South, of course. And so one of the issues that they're having in both college football and the NFL is you're, the majority of your players are African-American, yet as you go up the decision-making ranks, they don't mirror the, the, the labor, if you will, right? And so Number one, you have to be conscious of that. And you can't have, not, I'm not going to say can't, right? Because I don't know everything, but it's very difficult to have honest conversations that also center fragility, right? And sometimes in order to be honest, you have to say things that might hurt people's feelings as respectfully as possible, of course, right? So as a man, a woman had to teach me that the friend zone is a male social construct that men use because they're, they're, our egos are soft and we can't handle women telling us no, right? And as a man, I was like taken aback, but fortunately I was in a space to listen to her and, and we were able to, that has changed my life in terms of how I interact with women. I would say the same thing from diversity and inclusion, equity, diversity, all that different stuff. If you're going to have an honest conversation, Julie, then you have to put all the cards on the table so that we all know that we're working from the same standpoint. We're working towards the same goals. And that might mean that you're going to have to add different people to your inner circle or um, uh, advisory groups um, uh, or your focus groups 
earlier in the process um, and working with people like, you know, David or me or work, depending on who you're trying to reach out to earlier in that process versus later is going to get you a much more, a wider uh, birth of participants and thought, right? So Worth said that he identifies as cisgender, uh, cis male gender, um, um, and uh, a white person, right? So white male, cisgender, which is great. But as he also illustrated, there's so many spectrums, right? Black is also not a monolith. So just because you get me in the room doesn't mean I'm going to have all the ans- all the answers for black people. There are old black people, conservative black people, you know, uh, rich, poor, uh, all kinds of people. So you're going to have to be very conscientious at the beginning of your conversations to get people in the room who can then point you to other people. It's going to be an ongoing process. But again, that's why diversity and inclusion should be considered verbs and and not just uh, taglines. Excellent. Thank you so much to KJ. I think that was a a really good, um, I think that that probably got to the the heart of that question. Yeah, I think Um, actually, I think, I think were you, one of your key points and your, your, presentation was on the right about handing the mic over that's kind of relevant yeah i think uh everything kj said really resonates and from the start uh we knew that uh you know the again you know lgbtq plus is not a monolith and and also that in virginia even regionally there are different different cultures of people queer appalachia is something you see that's exploding and is a very political scene there's some really great social channels representing uh, different states and queer Appalachia and you know we have the ability to like some of the things that they share and agree with those and look at the art and the culture and the music coming but you know we at the same time we don't have to pay and join in on you know something that is uh, maybe a political statement something like that um, to KJ's point everything you do you know is a uh, is supporting an organization and uh, with so many different groups, you know, you're not going to be able to support everyone. Uh, one example is, you know, anytime we do something large that picks up uh, with the LGBTQ plus Virginia, I will get emails from uh, maybe one or two Virginia businesses saying, how dare you do this? I want nothing to do with this. I can't believe we're spending state dollars. And usually our responses will bless your heart and we move forward and doing what we're doing. So what we're doing is something that not everybody's going to want to be included in. And then if you are in the LGBTQ plus community, it's so diverse and intersectional that for us, we're never going to have a campaign that focuses on all of that. And again, I can call all of our Virginia DMOs and go, hey, uh, what do you have that's LGBT friendly? What does that mean? And so we really have started focusing more and more on locals. And I'm not going to have a palette and say, here's all the great people LGBTQ plus people in a certain workville, it's I'm going to go to workville and look at the locals and they're going to tell me what's true and who they are. And I'm going to hand that mic over and they're going to tell their story and where they recommend. And it's not going to be me creating a campaign. It's going to be me sharing their voice. And although every now and then someone's like, wow, that's a lot of work for me. It's actually great. It's brand new tourism stories that have never been told Virginians welcoming other Virginians who've never connected. So at the end of the day, uh, you know, it really is about what's true and just focus on that and hand that mic over. And there's no need for copywriting and no need for hiring models. That's who they are. And that's, you know, true. I don't say the word authentic anymore because now Hardy's has an authentic artisanal uh, pencil bread hamburger. So I don't even use the word authentic anymore because I don't know what that means anymore. So for me, it's just who's speaking. It's true. And it's their life. They're connecting with the visitor and just give them the mic. Thank you. So we're coming towards the end. Um, I'm going to try to get this uh, monster of a question in at the end. Um, I'm going to first direct it to David, um, uh, but I definitely want to hear from everyone as to why it's valuable to have these to be story driven rather than simply hiring a diverse cast or, um, you know, putting a, a pride flag up in the background of something like that. Why, why, what is the importance of story narratives? 
Yeah. So, you know, I'm very biased to like a very documentary leaning campaign, marketing or, or not. And, and even trend wise, you know, just, just the more integrated marketing, as they like to call it, or, or branded stories or branded documentaries has become a very valuable way. And it, and it has evolved with how people digest content. And when you look at legacy commercials, uh, like your 30, 15 second, 30 second, 60 second commercial spots that you traditionally saw on broadcast television, you know, you're, you're presenting the, the, the bullet points of the most sterile version of your market. And, and that, worked at one time, but you know, people really want to be able to resonate on a broader scale or even find commonality. And so really leaning into the story driven aspect where like Wirt was saying, you know, we're not trying to cast people who are diverse. We're not just trying to have like your token brown person, your token queer person and, and your, uh, your blatantly attractive female, you know, uh, what you're doing is literally asking people who are a part of these communities and to be candid and and to share their, share their background, share, uh, and sometimes indirectly sharing what their identity is, you know, it'll come out in the story. And then also like sharing their hardships because their hardships are relevant to where they live. But often people who still face hardships, whether it's, you know, they work three or four jobs, you know, and they, they, you know, like if I say outdoor activities, you know, use a bias, but they hike every Sunday. It's their one day off and they love to go hiking and they're, uh, you know, let's just say they're, they're, um, you know, they're, they identify as lesbian. And, and so they go out with, you know, this queer group of or lesbians on, on a hike. And that's a part of their story. That's the happy part. That's the spotlight. But you're giving them a chance to tell that from their perspective. And you can't do that in a casted, pre-scripted legacy media style piece you have to and, and and this stuff can be it doesn't have to be motion i think that's what's really valuable even though i'm biased to video of course you know it can be in photos you can do photo essays that are just as meaty and just as valuable and, and just as substantial to tell those stories from that person's perspective and i and oftentimes even people with the more the most fringe uh, uh, demographic, you know, in some communities like where I live, you know, a, a trans person would be very fringe in this community. But even that person, I guarantee they're going to have something that's relatable to a broad spectrum. And so if you can present it in a very articulate way and, and carefully crafted, people will be able to resonate with the story first and then their identity can be presented in a very approachable way. And and then that way those, but then also that community gets representation in in a genuine way, like it's just not manufactured. And I think that's ultimately always the always goal. It can't, you can't manufacture it. Thank you, David. Okay, so um, we do have a few more things. David, if you could share the uh, big bullet points at the end of that, um, the slides for me. I can. And as we look over these, um, panelists, feel free to kind of pop in um, with some things that these were taken from all of our notes beforehand. Um, So if you have something to add, um, please go ahead. So these are just um, a few things that we we definitely talked about um, putting the work in. You know, this isn't just as simple as saying, oh, I included a marginalized identity or I uh, asked my friend. Um, what they thought of this, you know, this this means investing in your research and development, but it also means taking an interest in the issue outside of just your specific campaign, sort of understanding um, some of what's going on normally. Um, as KJ brought up, speaking with your dollar, um, making sure that you're putting the money where you think it matters. And we can go to the next slide. Oops, sorry. No problem, thanks. Have an open mind and heart. Uh, Alicia mentioned learning so much through the process of working with um, uh, communities that she hadn't before of just understanding what they were going through on a day-to-day basis. Um, And that's gonna be something that uh, I I think most people who are trying to um, tell inclusive and diverse stories are are going to have the experience of. And also keep it up. This isn't necessarily gonna work immediately. Um, 
you want to make sure you're you're starting at the beginning with an inclusive mindset, uh, keeping that through the R and D and production, and of course getting to distribution. We didn't get to this, but uh, David had mentioned making sure that. Um, things are subtitled, things are available in multiple formats so that people of different abilities or um, when you're considering uh, Spanish-speaking populations, that they are able to get the communication through, um, through whatever you're creating. Um, and that's about all that I have uh, to talk about. Thank you to all of our panelists um, so much for uh joining us today and lending their time thank you to everyone who joined us um i hope that uh we uh answered some of the questions you might have on this topic uh, i'm going to switch over to david because he'll know more about how you can get some of this information um uh as after after we end this webinar yeah, totally. So I will be sending up a file. Everybody who registered, as long as you included your email, um, I will include a summary, including links to projects that are that everybody has been working on, as well as everyone's contact information. Um, and I'll, and then I will, uh, and then if not, we'll make sure that uh, Veronica at the Southeast Tourism Society um, will also share that information. And this webinar will be recorded and uploaded, so you'll be able to rewatch it and if you please. Um, I think I, I think. Uh, there's a few people lingering around. So if anybody wants to give like a final thought of anything that they'd like to share, um, you know, I, uh, uh, KJ, why don't we start with you? Do you have a final thought? Uh, yes. First of all, thank everyone for watching, taking time out of your day. Thank you all for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to give my perspective. My final thought would be, especially when you're reaching out or trying to expand your marketing to maybe groups that you haven't normally worked with. Um, I said earlier, negotiate with grace, but I want to add a little something with that. Also understand that a lot of the people, David said this, a lot of people who are doing the work every day may not necessarily think of themselves as marketers or consultants um, and be willing, you know, I'm asking that DMOs be willing to still reach out to those people because uh, these are opportunities that come for some of these people that may come along once in a lifetime. They don't know what they can be until someone gives them the opportunity. So if you're scrolling through Instagram or YouTube and you see someone who's doing some stuff that you're like, yo, we really want to showcase that the way they're doing it. Call them in, have them, well, not in now, we're in COVID, but have a meeting with them virtually or digitally um, and, you know, help them understand how their voice or their work can be valuable. And you may be starting new businesses and that's, that's taking it to the next level. That's past just dirt, diversity and inclusion. You may be creating wealth for some of these people because once they get in there, they learn the game. They can work with DMOs all over the country and all over the world. So don't think of it as just, you know, um, what can we get from them? But you may be blessing someone in a way that could totally change their life by thinking outside of your traditional boxes. Yeah. Respect. Uh, Alicia, do you, do you have any final thoughts? Sure. Um, you know, from a tourism perspective, we're in the business of making memories and experiences. That's what we are trying to sell. And um, at the end of the day, people just want to be heard. They want to tell their story and what a platform we have to tell that story. And like you all have mentioned, it's relatable. It's relatable to every single one of us, even the things that you all have said today, um, you know, are relatable. I've learned so much from each of you already today. Um, so in final point, Let's work together, find those connections in your community. Even if you're just starting a campaign or you're latching on to one, work together. Great. Work? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, Sage mentioned earlier, she was reading the bullet points about uh, accessibility. And uh, I had the pleasure this past year to be on a panel where I talked about LGBTQ plus and then just in general uh, diversity in Virginia. But I had co-panelists, one who's focused on traveling with autism, either yourself or someone in your family on the autism scale. And then also beside me was a couple who are fantastic. They, uh, he is uh, in a wheelchair, he's a wheelchair user, um, and his wife, they're an interracial couple. And you know, just all of us together on that panel, really for me was about the future of collecting these stories, just finding people, again, their truth and sharing their story. So more and more, 
uh, accessibility, whether it be because of your race or your uh, income or, you know, what, what do you not have access to and how can you get it and tell those stories and, and share that with people. So I think uh, just that autism focus and also uh, mobility accessibility, you know, those were just great examples of everything coming together, that intersectional group uh, that will give us new opportunities, I think, in the future, new stories to tell uh, and really affecting people's lives. So I think it's a great thing. Awesome. Well, um, I, I'm actually, I'll, in the follow-up email, I'll add a little thing that we didn't get time to cover is, is, um, is some just tools that you can use for sex accessibility within video. Um, two of the, the things I was going to bring up is, is Spanish speakers um, and uh, deaf and hard of hearing, which actually is very similar of how you can, within marketing, uh, with videos specifically, but also some uh, websites for language. I'm going to include some stuff. I'm going to, I'll put it on our website as long with, along with the follow-up. Um, and then if anybody has questions about uh, using that, you'd be happy to uh, email me. But I just want to personally thank everybody who participated in the panel that uh, that agreed to come here. This was a, a very um, exciting, uh, this is a subject that's really important to me and I think very important to everybody who participated and also terrifying to, to be so candid about uh, race and, and uh, gender identities and, and just uh, it, I just hope everybody enjoyed it and, and just want to thank you all and I want to thank everybody who, who attended and, and, and watched so, so I hope uh, hope you all enjoyed it. Okay well hope everyone has a good day and we are going to close out. See everyone some other time. <laughs> <laughs>